Wallingford Inland Wetlands Water Course Commission order. The date is September 7th and the time is 7.05. Will you join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Signage up. Okay, let's start with a roll call. Allie. Allie McKean. Jim Vitale. Deborah Phillips. Jeffrey Nacchio. Michael Caruso. Jim Heilman. And Aaron O'Hare, environmental planner. Okay, at this time we'll consider the minutes of the regular meeting of July 27th. Is there any comments regarding the minutes? I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the minutes of the regular meeting on July 27, 2022 be accepted as submitted. Okay, uh, is there a second? A second. Okay, call for a vote. Deb? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jim? Yes. And Mike, you weren't here, Al, you weren't, and, and me, uh, yes. Carolyn's the one that's missing. Okay. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, what have we got? We got two, four, six. I'm going to, the, the voting members tonight will be uh, Debbie, Jeff, Jim, myself, and Allie. So oh, therefore, the, the, uh, our, we're going to start with application A, 227.1, 549 Woodhouse Avenue, Tyler Mill. Come up. Aaron, do you want to speak for them, so what's going on? They're prepared to describe their application tonight, but essentially it's just a pedestrian footbridge <clears throat> replacement project. We, the commission approved one, the first one in 2011. This is a replacement. And, but it, since it's going through wetlands, that's why they need a permit. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Kenny Michaels, okay. Director of Parks and Recreation. Okay. Uh, I have with me today uh, Mr. Ken Rowe uh, and Dr. Joe Robles, um, both residents who are uh, recreational users of, of Tyler Mill who put forth this proposal to us um, which um, sparked the, 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 the permit. Um, we're looking to replace 120 feet um, of this bog bridge or footbridge, which is along the green trail in Tyler Mill. Um, as Aaron had mentioned, the trail currently uh, there was put in in 2011. It's starting to rot, uh, deteriorate, um, pretty much come apart. So we're looking to repair this footbridge uh, to continue access for recreational users on the green trail, um, so they're not going through the, the, the mud and the wet spots through the, uh, through the trail system. Um, so the, the, the bridge will be uh, constructed using existing cedar that has come down within Tyler Mill. Um, that will be cut to 32, 32 inches, right? 32 inches uh, wide all the way through to replace uh, the existing bridge. Um, there's 24 feet or two sections of 24 foot um, bridging currently there that's going to be transported. It's going to be moved um, to an area over by the Woodhouse soccer fields, which is going to 
replace a, a, a bridge that's deteriorating there, and it's going to you know, create accessibility for people to get in the trail system on that side as well. Um, the work's going to be done by volunteers and the uh, Conservation Commission. Um, I think that's it for me. I even got uh, one question. You're taking uh, these red cedar trees that are down? Yes, uh, red cedar that's blown down. Yeah. Red cedar the, that's the, the, blown down, uh, only what's already on the ground. Well, there's probably not too many standing because uh, a mite got all, of, got all mine and got all the other ones I've seen. But you're, you're going to make them 32 inches wide? Is that the planks on the trail, on the bridge? Yes, the purpose of 32 inches is to make it and wide are you, enough. Are you going to flatten these out? I mean, are you going to saw them? We're going to cut them uh, once down the middle. Uh, so you, then you'll have two planks? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Allie? No. Deb? No. Jeff? No. Mike? No. Nope. Jimmy? No. Okay. Then I will entertain a motion regarding significant activity. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion on application A22-7.1, 549 Woodhouse Avenue, Tyler Mill Preserve, uh, be deemed not a significant impact activity. Is there a second? A second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? All for a vote. Allie? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Deb? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, now I'll entertain a motion to approve or deny this application. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that application A22-7.1, 549 Woodhouse Avenue, Tyler Mill Preserve, be approved with the two conditions on the environmental planner's report of September 2nd, 2022. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? For a vote. Allie? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. Yes. All set. Thank you very much. Okay. So the main event tonight will be the continuing continuation of a public hearing for five research parkway. The application is A22 5.1. Five Research Parkway, Wallingford, LLC. I'm going to handle this one a little bit differently tonight. First of all, commissioners, th this is uh, commissioners that were not here last month. Um, I want to know if you feel comfortable being able to act upon this tonight, that you've maintained um, uh, all correspondence and reviewed either uh, on television or video or regulations. And I think that includes Allie. Yes. And Mike. No. Okay. Um, you want to hear me voice all that out, don't you? Uh, the, I did watch the video online of the last meeting. I have reviewed all the materials, and I may or may not abstain at the end of this. <laughs> well, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of information. Now, this public hearing is for the protection. I'm sorry, I'm a double time hearing. Has your phone? Your, yes, I'm on. I. You, you can't hear me? You think it's in, in their system? Okay, I don't, I, I don't know what, what can I do to, to help you hear it? I mean, do you want me to get the TV people? 
Jimmy, would you pull them and say we seem to have big trouble? Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Testing, testing, one, two, three. <laughs> okay, commissioners, I think that means we need to speak up, but they have technical technicality or technical difficulties in the camera room. I haven't heard that in television for 50 years, but, but that's what they indicate today. They don't usually have cameras set up, and everything seems to run much smoother. Maybe you want to move down closer to the front, if that would help. It's much better now? Okay. Okay, they pushed the right button, I guess. Okay. Yes, yes again. Yes. It's greatly improved. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, now, this is, this is a public hearing for a project uh, in Research Parkway. It is a wetland, inland wetlands commission public hearing focusing on wetlands and water courses in Wallingford. So if, when we start to open up to the public, there's no discussion on trucks and, and traffic and all, there's a lot of things that are a planning and zoning issue that's not a wetland issue. So we gotta stay focused on wetlands issues. Now, this so, um, I'm gonna open the, the public hearing at 7.15 for the record. And there is a couple things I wanna ask Aaron first before you start your presentation. Aaron, according to the memos in the packet of information, uh, water and sewer are, have no, uh, well, they have a list of conditions of approval and that, and they're satisfied if this applicant does the list of conditions. Is that correct? If they meet all those conditions that the water division specifies in there, then yes, the water division will be satisfied. Okay. Now, similar for the memo from engineering. If they meet all of engineering's concerns. Yes. And conditions of approval, they're satisfied also. They, they will be. They will be if they, they satisfy the concerns. So now you have a list of concerns or, or conditions of approval from Minland Wetlands. Have you reviewed them? We, we have, Mr. Chairman. There was uh, a, a partial list provided to us about 10 days ago or so, and um, there were two new conditions added this afternoon. I spoke with the environmental planner, uh, and I know my client's been reviewing them, and I believe they're all acceptable. Acceptable, you said? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we can, open, we can start the public hearing, and uh, whether we're focusing on those conditions or focusing on wetland impacts, I think that's the important issue. We may have some, uh, we may take items uh, as we go along. We'll have to see how this unfolds. So I'll uh, accept your presentation at this time. All right, Mr. Chairman, if I might, just for your record again, uh, Dennis Senaviva representing the owner and applicant. I'm an attorney with the Senaviva Law Firm, 721 Broad Street in Meriden. With me tonight, to my far left, is Jeff Dewey, one of the project en engineers from BL Company. Uh, to his right is Chris Gagnon, who will be making a good portion of the presentation, also an engineer from BL Companies. And to my immediate left is Matt Davison, our soil scientist, wetland scientist, um, who has written uh, the environmental and wetlands impact a report. We have representatives from the owner in the audience to answer any questions that this commission might have. And um, I did read the memorandum, uh, the, the report from your environmental planner. I do know the process. She and I have spoken at length about the timelines, and I do recognize that 
once you close the public hearing, you'll have 35 days to render a decision. And of course, during that period of time, as she and I have discussed, uh, as I discussed it with the town attorney, there's no new information that can be presented. Um, there's nothing new. It'll be simply a compilation of existing records so you can have that perhaps in, a, in a, whatever fashion you, you as commissioners deem, deem fit. I'm gonna do a quick recap. I know that's been a long time, a long process, but just for everybody. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Chris. You know, uh, there was a meeting back in, in May that was just to start the, the process, if we will, the clock running. We came to you on June 15th at your wetlands meeting and made, made the first introduction comprehensively of our project. Uh, we discussed the regulated activities. Uh, we talked about uh, the fact why we're here jurisdictionally. We had some activities, uh, both temporary and permanent, within the 50-foot uh, upland review area. And of course, the amount, the amount of impervious area exceeded the 20,000 square feet, which is your jurisdiction for, for uh, action by this commission. We made the representation then at the very first meeting, I think we made it at the, the July meeting, and uh, Jeff Dewey's prepared to make it again at this September meeting, but there is an overall decrease in stormwater runoff per the plan. Uh, that's both to as to volume and speed. There was a question uh, at the June 15th meeting about the location of the uh, Upland Review area, how the measurements are made, especially where the slopes exceed 50 percent and there's also that was the first discussion mr. chair you may recall I think you helped generate that about use of flocculants in the general erosion control plan rather than solely in the contingency plan that started the discussions on June 15th your staff uh, and other town staff were very generous to their time between that date and July 26 the day before the July 27th wetlands meeting we met with them on a number of occasions there were a number of written correspondence. I'm sure you have it in your thick files. Karen's provided that to you. And again, they were very helpful. We came to you on July 27th, the last time we were here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you gave us some direction on how you wanted that meeting to be handled, and that's the way it was handled. We did discuss again the regulated activities to make sure that everyone was on line with what those regulated activities are. Matt Davison uh, went into a lengthy explanation about his wetlands impact assessment report discussed uh, the uh, regulated activities and how those activities may or may not uh, impact on the, the wetlands. There was a longer discussion about the use of flock logs, and even though it was still in just our contingency plan, Matt Davison agreed with the chair and the commission that it should be incorporated into the regular um, uh, management plan, stormwater management plan, and, and it's there today. Um, you had indicated, Mr. Chair, you're most concerned about cons the construction phase. You talked a little bit about you know, some of the issues that have led to the problems along Spring Lake and how they were, there was the, you know, the advent of the highway and then other work when Bristol Myers um, was developed. And so one of the things that uh, uh, you told us to pay a great deal of attention to is not only the permanent um, development, but certainly during the course of construction as the land is opened up and to make sure that our, all of our controls were proper. And we'd like to believe, and I think Aaron can confirm that we, um, we did the belt and suspenders routine, and perhaps even more when it comes to the E&O uh, control plans. Uh, we also talked about construction debris. Uh, Commissioner Heilman talked about his concerns, and he said he, we have to avoid drainage going into that pit. That was one of the quotes in your minutes from that July 27th meeting, and we're gonna address that again tonight just to hopefully give a comfort level to you and all the commissioners. So what do we do from July 27th, and why are we here tonight? So, that from July 28th uh, until tonight, uh, we had first uh, met at a three-hour meeting on August 8th with Aaron to go over his wetlands report. There were additional revised plans based upon our discussions at the July 27th meeting provided to you and to your staff on August 10th. On August 18th, a very special day in America, it's my birthday, we met for four hours <laughs> uh, to discuss the revised plans and to respond to staff comments, water and sewer, engineering, a nice comprehensive meeting, um, you know, very well uh, handled by, by town staff. On August 25th, by the way, on the 18th, we tried to put together a plan, which is, again, things we discussed with this commission. We didn't want to come to this meeting unprepared or not having completed a work effort. So the thought was, we met on the 18th, Erin hopefully would get us her responses to our submissions and our, our discussion from the 18th within a week's time. She did. August 25th, she sent two communications. One were her questions about the revised plans we had submitted, 
and a second communication were her initial proposed conditions of approval. Again, that was well uh, appreciated because then four days later, on August 29th, we met for four and a half hours with Aaron, um, with the planner, town engineer, and we went through a review of those conditions of approval. As I mentioned, there's two new ones tonight, but Aaron had, had um, cued me in on that, uh, uh, at the, that event, and so we're familiar with those, and they're, as I mentioned, they're acceptable to the applicant. Um, we also uh, responded to her August 25th correspondence that was part of that four and a half hour meeting. Very productive. Final conditions of approval were proposed by water and sewer on August 31st. Those are also fine. And then there were final submittals by my client uh, also on uh, August 31st uh, with an addition of a final report from Matt Davison on September 1. He's revised it um, to include some additional information that Aaron sought that's been as late as today, so she has hopefully everything. She was kind enough to hand to me uh, right before the meeting her environmental planner's report for this evening. So I'd like to think that the six weeks or so from your last meeting were spent very productively, uh, an awful lot of time spent by your staff, and uh, my client and our team appreciates it fully. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight, Mr. Chair, because I think that Again, we seem to be in agreement with the recommended conditions of approval from your environmental planner, from your town engineer, and from your wetlands, uh, and from your rather your water department uh, engineer, senior engineer. Um, so that I just wanted to uh, turn it over to Chris to talk a little bit about um, the building debris. I want to make sure that everyone's comfortable with what we are and aren't doing uh, with your approval. Uh, and I wanted to talk also about you know, the contingency plan, just to make sure there's a comfort level. I'm sure you note, and hopefully all the commissioners note, that in the recommended conditions of approval, it suggests or requires, rather, that the applicant pay for an independent site monitor. And the site monitor, if you read, and I'm sure you all have read the scope of his or her work on this project, it's pretty extensive and it's, it's awful powerful. And we didn't, you know, push back on that. The applicant directed me not to push back on that. They said, listen, we want this to be successful. Uh, it's a similar interest as this commission has. So um, we're, we're comfortable, and, and I think what Chris will explain even further is that there's additional monitoring from DEP that, that is part of a, this sort of size um, uh, activity. So that there's a lot of uh, belts and suspenders, as I indicated, as part of this. But I do want to just go through everything so that uh, at least in the final part of our presentation, this commission not only has heard and seen the plan, but now talked about those issues that came up specifically during the course of our discussions. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Gagdon. Excellent, thank you, Attorney Senaviva. I know we've been having microphone issues. Is this working for everyone? Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Gagdon. I'm a professional engineer licensed here in Connecticut. I work with BL Companies, 355 Research Parkway uh, in Meriden, Connecticut. Um, oh, here I am talking about the pictures I'm showing, and I'm not showing any pictures. Um, so, uh, a lot of, I'm going to start with the um, current conditions out on the site and the um, material in question that uh, I believe um, there was concern regarding um, its its use on site and potential flow of water uh, through it. Um, and then I'll go into the, uh, the impacts and, and Matt Davison from Davison Environmental will help me out with that. And then um, we'll, we'll, we'll summarize. But um, so this is a, a picture uh, depicting the site conditions as they are today. Uh, as you can see, the funky shape of the area reflects the old funky footprint of the building. And this building uh, was demolished as required for regulations. And the, m much of the material, most of the material was removed from site as required from, from any sort of building demolition, uh, appropriately uh, landfilled or recycled. Um, the remaining uh, material, which is classified as clean fill material, uh, is, is essentially broken up 
concrete and, and bricks, maybe some of the granite that was out there, and we stockpiled it in this location. And the reason we placed it here is because, um, you know, much like many of our houses, due to the elevation change in this site when this building was in place, we had a concrete foundation wall that went across here, and then it was essentially a walkout type structure, like a, a typical ranch in many of our, our houses. And we left the material in this location as a safety measure rather than having um, an exposed foundation wall. And as you can see, this is all um, essentially material that is processed and for all intents and purposes ready to be used as a clean structural fill. So I wanted to show this picture to, to kind of demonstrate the existing conditions and the, the, the material uh, itself. We have consulted with the water department and indicated to them where we intend to use this material on site as it is um, a, a nice structural material. It makes sense to use it as a base for foundation or roads and the uh, water department has indicated that they are comfortable with the use of that material. Uh, along with that, um, we prepared a quick exhibit. Whoops. Um, depicting where the existing building, not existing, previous building, currently demolished building, is located with respect to the proposed development. Because there was some concern that, um, that we would possibly be introducing uh, runoff and things like that into this demolished area of the structure, and um, there was some concern about the water running through that. As you can see, the majority of the previous footprint of the building is encompassed by our, either our proposed building or parking lot. So the majority of this building, uh, previous foundations and any sort of material, uh, will not be receiving direct runoff. It will be <clears throat> falling on the roof, collected through our um, piping system. Um, as you recall, we are infiltrating roof runoff in this location here. Uh, we are not infiltrating roof runoff in the back uh, to, um, to respond to some comments from uh, town staff as well as the commissioners. So as you can see, the majority of the site um, of the previous building is encompassed by either proposed building or parking lot. So uh, the, the intent of this um, exhibit and the photo before was uh, to hopefully address any concerns with respect to runoff flowing through either previously demolished material or the, the old footprints of the, of the building. So uh, that is that um, part of it. As the chairman indicated, um, this is the Wetlands Commission, and the Wetlands Commission needs to be focused on the regulated activities that are occurring on site. And for this project, we have um, two, two types of regulated activities. We have the temporary construction regulated activities, and we have the um, permanent post-construction regulated activities. And what we did based on uh, all of those meetings that uh, Attorney Senaviva referenced, uh, the environmental planner requested that we provide a summary of the impacts in a three-part format. So we have this simple summary here, this, this, um, this list of the, of the impacts the two temporary impacts and the four permanent impacts. We also prepared 
maps reflecting the two temporary phase impacts, which are discharge from this sediment basin and discharge from this sediment basin here. So we have a pictorial exhibit reflecting the impacts as well as the list. And then the final piece of the puzzle is a summary that was provided by the environmental uh, team on this project, Davison Environmental. And in this summary, since I'm starting with the temporary phases, I'm going to scroll down to that first. Uh, in this summary, they provided their comments on the temporary impacts and the, their, their opinion related to the temporary impacts. So um, I'm going to real quickly tap our team member, Matt Davison of Davison Environmental, to discuss quickly, not quickly, discuss thoroughly and um, the the temporary construction phase impacts, and then we'll go over to the, the, the permanent impacts. But again, this is a, a summary that was requested by Aaron. We have provided it since the last hearing, so I wanted to just take a moment to discuss this right now. Thanks, Chris. Uh, for the record, Matt Davison, Davison Environmental, um, a professional wetland scientist, certified soil scientist, um, Certified Professional in Erosion and Sediment Control, and a Connecticut What's Certified up? Forester. You want lights up? Do you want the lights back up, or do you have um, mapping? That, that's okay, yeah, because, Chris, if you don't mind putting back up the map that shows the... Um, okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and, and as Chris indicated, um, we tried to simplify <laughs> for the, at the request of staff in particular um, and, and discuss uh, the temporary impacts and then go into the four regulated activities that were identified. And so I'll, I'll discuss each of these things individually um, for clarity. Uh, I'll start with the temporary impacts. Um, and again, this is in the letter that was just submitted today. Uh, these is, this is concerns related to construction phase impacts. Um, there's really two, there's two discharge points for the construction impacts. They are from the sediment traps, the, the four sediment traps, which discharge to the small pond, and then also the larger basin, which will serve to provide stormwater treatment both during construction and also um, after its construction, the larger basin. As a wetland scientist, obviously I don't design these plans, but I've certainly reviewed a number of these plans and I do stormwater inspections as a part of my erosion control license on a regular basis to, uh, for stormwater general permit compliance. And what I'll say about this plan is I've never seen this many um, structures in a train as, as this plan has. Um, this plan includes, a, a typical plan you'll see a diversion swale going into a sediment trap, the sediment trap outlets towards a wetland. In this particular case, we have diversion swales, which are lined, which have check dams, which include flocculent products. These discharge to sediment traps. The sediment traps are outfitted with skimmers, which are intended to basically filter out, basically capture the water at the highest portion of the water column. So the anticipation is that that highest portion is least turbid and lacking sediment. That discharges into another version, which goes into a final settling basin, which again is outfitted with, uh, I believe, a skimmer and a raised outlet control structure. That discharges into the small pond. The small pond, um, the history on that is that was a created pond, which was created originally for stormwater treatment. Um, we've discussed internally um, as a final contingency plan, even being having the capability to draw down that pond in the case of emergency. That pond outlets to the larger pond, which is a part of the Muddy River Corridor. Um, the other stormwater management, the other uh, discharge from the temporary construction is the larger basin. Uh, again, similar controls, diversion, flocculent products, a number of check dams, a skimmer, and then that final outlet is located over 100 feet from the wetland. I do not have concerns with discharges from this basin. 
And I think it's also important to know <clears throat> um, the importance of uh, the stormwater general permit. And I think, you know, as a commission, you're looking at the construction phase impacts, and obviously your concern as a commission is impacts to water resources, and it's your job to regulate that. But the construction phase impacts are regulated at the state level, and it's actually mandated by the federal government under the Clean Water Act. So the Connecticut general permit is uh, a function of the Environmental Protection Agency's National Pollution Discharge Elim Elimination System. It's a Clean Water Act mandated permit. Um, the states are given the option to enforce that themselves or to opt out, in which case you have to get a permit from the EPA. In Massachusetts, they defer to the EPA. So if you were doing this project in Massachusetts, you would get a permit from the EPA for this construction. In Connecticut, they use the Stormwater General Permit. This permit is not taken lightly by the state. I can tell you there, I've seen numerous circumstances where they shut down projects that are not compliant. As a requirement of the Stormwater General Permit, there's weekly inspections. The reporting is done electronically through the state. Um, and the state, uh, again, takes this very seriously. Um, Clean Water Act violations um, can be over $37,000 a day. I've seen uh, Clean Water Act violations for discharges from construction activities in exceedance of a million dollars um, within the last few years from a solar site. Um, so there is another level of protection here. And again, as, as Chris mentioned, um, there's also a third party monitor here in addition to the required monitor. So, and I think that's very valuable here. I think that's, um, so the site will be uh, maintained and there will be a lot of oversight. Um, with respect to each of the individual um, or the four uh, regulated activities that were identified. Um, is there any way to zoom in, Chris? <clears throat> of course. You want to go to, are you going over to permanent now? Yeah, yeah. let's start with the uh, Ampelin Review Area, the regulated activity one, which is the discharge from the sand filter. So, the this, this sand filter discharges um, about 100, is it 100 feet away from the small pond. Yep. Um, you can check that. Sand filters are, cons so, uh, and, I, and I'm going to say the same thing about the um, stormwater treatment measures on this site. Um, the stormwater treatment measures are very robust. On a typical raw land development as a wetland scientist, I recommend that, uh, that the site include primary treatment of stormwater. In this particular case, there's primary treatment of stormwater. Primary treatment, if you look at the 2004 Stormwater Quality Manual, is the best treatment. So it's, it's acknowledged to be the, the best treatment for water quality. Um, there's very specific requirements for primary treatment. Sand filters are considered primary treatment under the Stormwater Quality Manual. The, in this particular case, there's also a number of secondary treatments that are um, being utilized ahead of the primary treatment. In other words, there's a treatment train. These include uh, or technic units, catch basins. So the, again, the stormwater treatment system here is very robust. It includes a number of secondary, and pri uh, secondary treatment measures and a primary treatment measure in a train. This is what, we, what I look for as a wetland scientist. With respect to the discharge, this, the discharge is 100 feet from the small pond. Again, the small pond was constructed to, man to handle and capture stormwater from previous um, um, site development. So a, a, having a stormwater outlet from a primary treatment practice 100 feet from a pond, I am not concerned with. Um, and, and with respect to alternatives, as you'll recall, that was previously located much closer to the pond, and during the course of this application, that has been shifted further away. So I am content with, with that particular regulated activity. Regulated activity number two is the activities within an existing road for utility connections. Um, Chris is highlighting it there. It's located between the two ponds. Um, again, this work is being done within an area that's already uh, developed and disturbed. Um, I'll also point out that the alternative here, there was a previous, uh, the utility connection was previously located in a crossing of the Muddy River. So this has been changed minimize the activities within the Alpine Review area, and it's essentially activities within an area that's, that's already paved and disturbed. Um, with your standard erosion control measures, silt fence, I do not have concerns with this um, regulated activity. Um, 
The third regulated activity is the stormwater discharge from the stormwater management area to the upland review area. Um, again, uh, this is from the large basin. The large basin includes a primary treatment practice, which is the sand filter, directly into a secondary treatment practice, which, which is the stormwater management basin, which then discharges to a level spreader over 100 feet from, from the wetland. This is, um, this is perfectly acceptable by all um, measures of stormwater treatment. Um, the level spreader will disperse the um, outletting stormwater. Um, there, it, there will be no velocity in that discharge. The level spreader is in, obviously intended to dissipate the flows. The flows will be carried over upland, vegetated uplands, again, over 100 feet to the down gradient wetland. I would fully anticipate that those flows would not be conveyed in a surface water all the way to the wetland, that they'll infiltrate at some point in that 100 feet. And so there's, I, again, have no concerns with that, um, that particular regulated activity or discharge there. And lastly, <clears throat> um, was the concern about the uh, additional impervious cover on the site. All developments, you know, in, in result in an increase in impervious cover, cover, whether it's roofs or driveway or parking areas. And really the purpose of a stormwater management plan is to handle that increase in impervious cover, both the, the peak flows that are discharged, the volume of discharge, and the water quality of that discharge. And so again, this stormwater treatment system is extremely robust. Um, all stormwater receives secondary and primary treatment. Um, the, um, one of the concerns that was brought up, and, and this may be something where, where, where Jeff can, can dovetail into this, but one of the concerns from some of the um, downstream neighbors um, was the uh, flooding downstream. And so one of the benefits of this particular plan is that it actually reduces the peak runoff from the site as well as the volume of runoff from the site. So, the importance of that is that this site is in the upper watershed of the Muddy River. When you're operating in the upper watershed, any decreases in runoff are, are very valuable as opposed to being where at the bottom of a watershed where the water's exiting that watershed. So you get the most benefit in the upper watershed. So it's, I don't anticipate it's a large change, but nonetheless, it's, cer it, it's certainly not going to exacerbate the flooding issue. It, it, it has the potential of, um, of benefiting that that circumstance. Um, the other uh, uh, staff had also raised a concern about um, uh, altering the hydrology of the wetland that's just below the, uh, the, the major part of the development, the paved area. I don't know if you could point to it there, Chris. <clears throat> um, just below that, the wetland area there. Uh, that, yeah, that wetland right, uh, just to the right there. This oh. wetland here, yeah. Um, staff had expressed concern about the, um, what this development would do to the hydrology of that wetland. And so we did evaluate the contributing drainage areas um, pre and post. Um, the pre-development drainage area for that particular um, wetland is 19.64 acres. The post-development drainage area will be 17.95. There's a slight reduction. That reduction is actually the stormwater basin that's located just to the right of it. I do not have any concerns about that area, uh, the loss of that area contributing to that wetland, um, altering the hydrology of that wetland. I think it's important to note that that wetland is already shaded by the existing development. There is no direct discharges from the existing development to that wetland area. It does not seem to be affected. And the reduction is really for a stormwater basin that's going to be accepting water anyway. Um, the basin's not designed to infiltrate, but we do anticipate some infiltration, which will enter into the groundwater and also help feed that wetland. But I don't have concerns. <clears throat> sure, sorry. I don't have concerns about the altering of the hydrology of that wetland area there. Um, I think that covers the, uh, the four regulated activities that were identified. Um, Correct happy to answer any questions and if, and if Jeff cares to elaborate on the oh, okay is that uh, fit into your schedule if we ask some questions now <clears throat> this would certainly be an appropriate time okay uh, commissioners you want the lights 
I think so. Yeah, Jim. Thank you. Went the other way. There we go. Oh. Okay. Commissioners, at this time, any questions? No. Allie? No. Deb? No. Jeff? No questions. Mike? No questions. Jimmy? Are you going to be getting into the... Um, the document you provided, the EH-71, this colorful display. Um, what we have here is quite remarkable, and the presentation was excellent, honestly. Um, you identified here an extremely powerful defense against erosion concerns. And I think it's due course, and I think the due course has to do with this document here and the amount of cut and fill and movement of material is really monumental. And without a system at least like that, if the peak of the storm we just experienced 48 hours ago happened to occur in that area, I don't think that would help it either. Uh, seven inches in less than 24 hours is pretty severe. Uh, I, I think our highway, I don't know, what do our high, what do our general road systems take an inch an hour for sustained uh, things? So anyways, uh, I, if you could uh, spend some time on that document, I'd appreciate it because I think it illustrates the necessity of what would otherwise appear to be an over robust uh, address to it. I think that addresses the concern I really had for what you are doing in that upper eastward section of this activity. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Heilman, for, for your comments. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss that. Uh, what Commissioner Heilman is referring to is a document that we prepared that demonstrates uh, the, the cut and fills with the site. I think I have it somewhere in here, if you bear with me. Uh, but I think, Jeff, are you prepared to, to cover that? So what, um, just for, for a little context, um, because we need to move the earth around, we have prepared the multi-phase erosion control plan that I think Commissioner Heilman was, uh, was referring to. And we also prepared that cut and fill drawing to uh, demonstrate uh, where the material would be moved to and also as a way to uh, provide some context with respect to infiltration and runoff flowing through the uh, demolished foundations as well. So it was it was kind of a multi-purpose document to to demonstrate where the material was going on. While I'm looking for it to share with the public, we'll let Jeff uh, discuss a little further. Could you grab the uh, drainage report, please? So I think. Um, in response to that, and that's a great point. We appreciate the question. Uh, as we have noted in the past, uh, and I don't think we've gotten into the actual numbers of it, the detention basin, the permanent, permanent detention basin, is greatly oversized and has minimal outflows for many of the storm events, including the 100-year storm event. Um, so the temporary sediment trap is basically the temporary version of the permanent detention basin. It doesn't have the same outlet control structure. It has a temporary outlet control structure because its intent is not as much stormwater detention, which it certainly is to let the material settle out, but it's also to detain the stormwaters. So if we look at the stormwater management report, um, a ways down we can look at the, the storm events. We'll look at the the amount of rain, I think it's early on. We actually, where we talk about the NOAA rain, how much, we, how much we actually design for in these storm events. And I apologize, Chris, I don't know exactly where it is in here. Okay, while we're here, so this is, we're looking for SWMB5, there we go. So we've designed a basin for up to a 100-year storm, which is 8.2 inches. So if you scroll down a little bit, Chris, we can look at, or actually, I'm sorry, it's up. The should be right above that. Is that the big detention basin? 
Yes. Okay, so for a 100-year storm with 265 basically CFS coming into that basin, we only have 21 CFS coming out of it. So that's over eight inches, an eight inch rainfall. Um, so as you look at the smaller storm events, how little outflow the basin has, which basically, so it's storing a large portion of these rain events. So over the course of a, thank you, over the course of a 24 hour period gives the initial part of the storm, which typically is where the peak is, is more towards the front of the storm. It can be to the middle, it can be to the end, it varies. You know, we all have seen different types of storm events. But basically, that basin has the ability to store, detain, and let suspended settle, uh, sediments settle out prior to discharge for even up to an eight, eight plus inch storm event. So, going back to two days ago, uh, I do not know exactly how much rainfall fell, but uh, going on Commissioner Heilman's statement that it was around seven inches that fell? Th that's what I heard in areas of Connecticut, but obviously not here. No, it, yes, we got seven inches. Yeah. Really? In, in the yes. Wallingford? The water department had 7.5. Uh, the news the other morning said Wallingford had 7.05. Okay. So yeah. based on that, and we all experienced it in plus or minus a 24-hour period, so that is actually a fairly standard storm in terms of the uh, stormwater analysis that we perform. So for our analysis are based on uh, a storm event of 24 hours, and uh, two-year storm events are three inches. So. Um, a three-inch rainfall is a pretty significant rainfall, and that is just qualified as a two-year storm event. The, this seven inches that fell in plus or minus 24 hours is somewhere between a 25-year and a 100-year storm event. So um, we all experienced it, so we know it was a real-life storm event, but th this is indicating that it, it was somewhere between a 25- and a 100-year and a storm event. And based on... Jeff's recent testimony, um, when we get a 100-year storm event, and this speaks to the mitigation of the additional impervious areas, when we get a 100-year storm event like we just had, that large basin that we are proposing on this side of the world here stores the majority of the runoff from the site and releases it in a very slow, at a, at a very managed rate of um, 20 CFS when there is actually 264 CFS flowing into it. So that, that really speaks to how we're mitigating for the um, additional impervious area on site. And then the other aspect of this plan that Commissioner Heilman referenced it shows the, the cuts and the fills at the site. So um, to, to construct this site, we need to raise the grade in the green areas, and we are cutting down the grade in the, in the red areas. So to, to move the material around, around, it is why we have prepared the um, robust erosion control measures, because as the site is being worked, um, we're, we're designing it in essentially five acre plots. That's what the erosion control regulations require. So we, we design it as each in five acre areas which has the own their, their own diversion swales, the check dams, there's flocculants in the diversion swales which go to settling basins which then go to a, another swale which then goes to another settling basin. So we, we understood the fact that we were moving this earth around and we are mitigating the construction phase with the robust erosion control plan and then we mitigate the permanent phase of the additional impervious area with this large stormwater basin which Jeff, Jeff just showed in our stormwater calculations is what really mitigates the flow by slowly releasing it compared to uh, when you compare it to the direct rainfall uh, amounts. And it's actually quite interesting that we just had almost a 100-year storm event two days ago. You all set, Jim? Uh, yeah, for now, no. yes. Yep. 
Do you need a, a dam permit for that size retention pond, holding that quantity of water? Uh, no, because this is an excavated pond, again, uh, referencing the uh, cut and fill. The pond itself is entirely in a cut. So if this was a pond where we needed to build a large berm and we're impounding water behind a man-made berm, we would um, definitely need to consult um, the, the, the state dam department to, to discuss that with them. You don't always need a dam permit, um, but, but because this is an excavated That's basin. Right. Yep. Aaron? But th there is a low berm around the edge, is there not? Yeah, because it's Jeff, in Jeff, Jeff Dewey from BL. Um, yes, in some areas there is a small berm, and basically uh, the DEP criteria is a six foot high berm. Anything over six feet is considered a dam and requires registration. Anything under six feet is, is a berm, then it's not considered a dam. Okay, you have any other questions, Aaron, at this time? Oh, yes, thanks. I, I understand, and thank you for that very thorough explanation of how this giant 1.5 acre hole in the ground is going to hold all this, the, how it actually could hold a 100 year storm, which it's designed to hold, and that's great. Um, both during the construction phase and after it's all built. I, I get that, and I, I'm on board with that. Oh, and by the way, we're going to maybe circle back later to your new under drain. But right now, but right now, but what I don't get, and if you could go through it, or is on the other side, where you go on during the construction phase, what's going into that small pond, okay? Uh, Okay, I get, and I've recently, in conversations with you guys, um, the existing flows to that small pond uh, at, compared to the final, all built out flows to that small pond are about 1% plus or minus the same. Storm flows go into that small pond today from the driveway area and around the former headquarters, that kind of area. So about 20% of this site's flows, or this development area, not the whole site, it's a 180 acre site, but this development area's flows go in, or today go into the small pond and will in the future go into the small pond and during construction will go into the small pond, oh, well, that Aaron, area. Aaron, if I may interrupt, no, that's, that's incorrect. Actually, uh, post-construction, most of the site will go to that larger pond that Chris was pointing out earlier. Currently, the, all the existing parking and all the roof area for the Bristol Myers Squibb facility all goes to the small pond. So we are taking a large portion of impervious areas and directing it into the basin and away from the small pond. So, okay, so maybe yesterday I was misinformed about that or, I don't know, Chris, but it was 1% plus or minus. So this POS3, Jeff, we got 1% plus or minus a 1% change. That's in the uh, muddy Microphone, room. microphone. What's the question, Aaron? Oh, uh, okay. Today, okay. So in the, f during construction phase, how much of the construction flows are gonna go in those uh, four sediment trap areas, ultimately to the small pond, and how many are going, uh, what percent of the, roughly, what percent of the flow, construction uh, flows are going to the basin? I think around 80% is going to the basin, and 20% is going to the small pond vicinity. Okay, yeah, um, I, that, that rings fairly true. I believe the actual numbers are in one of my response letters, and I apologize, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, was, that sounds about right. 20%. Right, right, because it's five acres, five acres, and five acres, right? Versus 29 acres on the top. So okay, I'm sorry. I, was, I thought you were talking permanent. No, 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 no. During construction. Correct. During okay, construction. yes, it's, it's almost 50% of the site. Okay. I apologize. So what I'm getting to is in a rainstorm like we had yesterday, I'm trying to wrap my brain around it, how these four sediment traps 
that go to a small settling basin and then go to the small pond. How they would deal with that, because in the memo you gave me on August 19th, you said that it starts flowing out of these sediment traps. It starts, the sedimented water starts flowing over the weir at a, between a one and two year storm. So if that's the case, then that's a one, that's, that's, you know, a one and two year storm. But now we're ramping up to a five year storm, 10 year storm, so it's gonna be flowing over those weirs and coming down that hill, that's a hill, coming all the way down. Now we're up to a 20 year storm, whatever, 50 year storm. How does, how does the system not get overwhelmed in the construction phase? So we need to be careful when we are mixing the analysis that we use for post-construction stormwater management and when we use for temporary erosion control. So with erosion control, you're required to design for a 90% a of the rainfall events that we get are, are an inch or below. So you're required to design the, storm, the erosion controls to handle the 90% of, of those storms. So it's not a direct analysis of, a direct comparison with respect to post-construction stormwater management models and erosion control designs. You, you, don't, you don't use the same storm events to design erosion control. So we, ju we just need to establish that first. So it's, it's not a direct analysis. That said, if during construction you have larger storm events, um, that, that is why you need to, why we have the independent site monitors to handle it. That's why we have the contingency plan in place to handle it. We have revised the contingency plan based on staff recommendations to also include the, um, the drawdown of the small pond, which will give us more volume of storage to help hold any runoff back um, during construction. And as Jeff has demonstrated, the large pond that we've been discussing, which is large enough to handle runoff from 80% of the site, which is essentially impervious, um, will be in place during construction. So we actually have a lot of significant volume of storage in the, in the large pond itself. Large basin. Large basin itself. And that's right, we call this the large pond. You're right, Aaron. The large basin, correct. Um, and we also have the, the, remember we have four sediment traps which are properly sized per the regulations for the area contributing to them. Um, so it's, it's not really appropriate to discuss what storm event erosion controls will fail at as that's not, where, that's not how they are um, designed in the, in the manual. Um, all that said, if we got a seven inch rainfall event during uh, when the site is open for construction, um, luckily these events we saw it coming. We all knew that that rain was coming. We have independent site monitors that will be on site to implement the contingency plan, um, good housekeeping, pump down or draw down the small pond as required. So what we have in place is the contingency plan when we see these events coming that we will, um, that we will implement. All right, you all set, Aaron? Okay. Um, no, I have actually another question okay. for okay. Come on. Matt and, and, and Chris. And before, going back before, Matt, you, you, but Matt and Chris both said, you guys both said that the <clears throat> sand filter was located 100 feet from the small pond. And I don't know why, could you explain why that matters, how many feet from the small pond it is? I mean, it, 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 it's connected with a pipe, is it not? Doesn't, uh, stormwater is piped, right, from the sand filter into the small pond directly. Isn't that true? Yes, that is true, and, and I apologize, apparently that was an oversight. Um, so, because it is piped directly to the small pond, 
have an overland flow would only affect it if it filled to capacity and uh, used the overflow. So I think the point that Matt and Chris might have been making is the actual installation of this sand filter is staying 100 feet away from the small pond to comply with the planning and zoning requirement? Is that what that reference was to the 100? Correct. That's why it's 100 feet and we okay. had previously adjusted it. So that doesn't apply to this commission. Which, yeah, and, and which but. doesn't diminish its effectiveness as a water quality device. Um, I'd like to know too, I mean, in Matt's discussion, there is also a Vortechnic in, in line prior to that smaller sand filter as well. So there's uh, extra deep sumps in the catch basins with hoods, a Vortechnic device, and then a sand filter. So basically we're cleaning that water three times. And it's discharging to a small pond which was constructed to manage storm water. Microphone. Microphone. Sorry. And, and it's discharging to the small pond, which of course was constructed to, to handle stormwater, currently handles stormwater from the, what was the development. But going back to the, the contingency plan for me, and I'm, I'm, forgive me if I'm beating a dead horse here, but the ability to draw down that small pond for me is, is really a fail safe because, and, and that was actually your recommendation, Aaron, for us to look more closely at that. But, the resource area that really needs to be protected is the other pond because that's the Muddy River corridor. And if you go out there today and you look at just the water quality visually, you can see the difference between the small pond and the Muddy yeah. River pond, right? The small pond is a raised outlet control structure. So in advance of a large storm event, those, as Chris stated, those third party monitors would have the ability, and we've incorporated it into our design or we've into our contingency plan to draw that pond down ahead of time. That would give that pond additional capacity to the extent that it would not, it wouldn't discharge into the resource areas we're really trying to protect. So I think that's that's a very important component of the stormwater management plan. How long would that take to pump that down? A lot of it would depend on um, the number and size of pumps. Sure. Um, there is also the outlet control structure, which is controlled with a slide gate, and it has a 30-inch pipe connected. So what are you planning to, to do? What, what is it? One day, two day, three day? What is your? Do you have a plan for the time it would take to pump that down? Because if you got a 12-hour warning or a 24-hour warning, it takes you three days to pump it down. You're in a lot of trouble. Well. Sir, and that's a very good point. So depending on how far out the storm is would be which contingency plan we would put in place. If we have three days, we could just adjust the outlet structure to allow more flow because we have time. If we needed to do it within 24 hours, we could employ both the outlet structure and include some pumping into what's called dirt bags to make sure that no sediment gets into the larger pond and do it in multiple levels to increase how fast we can pump it down. As long as it's there, that can work. Are we going to go back to that original thing? I, when you asked me if I had any questions, I thought we were gonna shoot back to that uh, EH7. I wanted to draw a relationship between those beautiful colors and the legend. Okay, Jim, hang, hang, we'll go back. Just hang on a minute though. Yeah. Let me finish with Aaron first. You're all set then right now? Yes, except no. I do want Jeff to circle back and talk about a, a new design for the basin that came in on Friday. Okay. All right, Jimmy, you go ahead, Jim. If you would, uh, if you'd go back to that, I'd, I'd like to uh, have you finish up with that illustration of what you need to take out of the, let's say, the southeast corner and what's going to get moved to the um, northwest corner. The transfer of fill there is very substantial, and that's the reason for all that sedimentation control systems you have. If you could diminish that so you could see the legend, because I think that tells the big thing, yeah, up there, well. What I notice in this is there's a lot of bright, light reddish in the southwest corner, upper right, and obviously that's the, the cut and the fill goes to the opposite corner, to the northwest. Am I correct in that? And we're talking on that, uh, that, that deep pink. 
uh, 40 to 50 feet you're cutting out of there and replacing 40 to 50 feet on the other side. That's a lot of material being moved. And I thought it was interesting to note that originally you were having the perforated pipe on that side, but that was taken out. Thank goodness, bedrock was there. And so that was the reason. I, I think that's a dual great thing that it's not going to be perforated pipe. Um, so that's good, but I, I think the major concern for the significance of this commission in this activity, that's a lot of material to be moved. And God help you if you get one of those storms come through while you were in the process of doing that. Which leads me to the last point I'll bring out. Is there a reason you wouldn't want to have that pond drawn down when you start cutting that slope open? Is there a serious environmental concern there with having it drawn down? So uh, I will let Matt um, provide some comment on that. But um, in terms of the pond drawdown itself, um, it was our intent to present to you a application that uh, did not have any activities within the footprint of any of your regulated activities. and we looked at the pond drawdown as being potentially a direct activity within your regulated areas. So we were um, trying to be sensitive to that. And perhaps we were oversensitive to that by not proposing the drawdown as a permanent feature. So it is presented here as part of the contingency plan um, if the commission is comfortable with that activity, then we are comfortable with doing that. But we did not want to propose any direct activities within the wetlands as part of our initial application. So that, that yeah. to provide some context as to why it was added to the uh, O&M plan, not as part of the initial application. I so think that, 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 that's fine, and uh, I appreciate that, however, in the history of what is going on here and knowing what could potentially happen. And as Mr. Bradley pointed out at the last meeting, he, part of the documentation we got from the Yale thing is the increased concerns. I'm not going to say what the cause would be, but there is a serious concern with increasing storms. Um, <clears throat> and quite honestly, I would be far more comfortable have that pond drawn down before you cut into that slope and open up the possibility of timing issues. I'd rather be safe than sorry, especially on something of this magnitude. You're putting all that effort in to protect it. Well, let's take one more step that would take it one step further in that protection. That, that's the most important thing in this activity is what you are going to do there. When it's all done and buttoned up, it, the concerns diminish quite a bit. Activity, though, is number one issue. The, the applicant would be comfortable with the drawdown of the pond as, as a... Well, I think that's probably a good plan. Per permanent Aaron, feature. you got another comment? Well, I'm just... What, Chris, would that be part of your proposal? Uh, yeah. Administratively, I don't know. It's totally up to you guys how to handle it. But if, if that is what the commission would like, that is definitely something the applicant would be comfortable implementing. I, I would just, for the record, I would not suggest a complete drawdown without relocating aquatic wildlife. So I think you could draw it down enough that whatever's living in the pond, aquatic species are still able to survive without relocation. We have done projects where we've had to relocate stuff. I, think, uh, I think that's something for you and Aaron to resolve a little later on. Now, you had another comment, Aaron? Oh, yes, about the underdrain. If, if um, on Friday there was a, I don't know if you noticed in your packet, there was so many much paper coming in, but there was like a three-page document from Jeff Dewey, I believe, on an underdrain system um, for the basin. Uh, they, because they realized the soils were not going to infiltrate as well as they thought they were. So they decided to underdrain. Would you like to talk about that, Jeff? Sure. So basically, um, so everyone understands, the, the drainage system design does not include infiltration. So our flow calcs 
uh, reduction in peak flow, reduction in volume, discharge leaving the site does not include any infiltration considerations. So it, any, it does not affect um, adding the underdrain does not affect our flows. So basically I'm working with the town engineer. She asked me to take a look at and see how long it would take that big basin to drain. And based on the soil testing, and granted there was only one infiltration test done in the area of the big basin, um, based on that test, the infiltration rates are slow, and Connecticut DEP uh, has a design recommendation of that a basin needs to drain out in 72 hours. That way, if there's a concurrent storm, the basin has the capacity to handle the next incoming storm. The infiltration rates were slow, didn't drain in the 72 hour period. So in speaking with Allison Kapuscinski, the town engineer, the best solution was to add an under drain system to the large basin. And that will allow it to drain within the 72 hour period. Drain where, to where? Uh, the same place it drains with the outlet. Basically the under drain system would be tied to the outlet control structure, which would then be tied to the uh, infiltration trench level spreader all right, what, what is your next step? You, you have more presentation at this point? Uh, because this is a significant activity, I do think we need to very briefly cover the um, prudent and feasible alternatives, uh, but I think we can do that very quickly. Other than that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we leap to that, I, I'd like, I have a question on the basin, if I may. I thought that's where you were going before, but go ahead. Okay, so if I may ask Jeff, at the last public hearing, July 27th, I believe it was that one, it could have been the one before on June 15th, but you were expounding how this application will in fact, well, it was in response to Mr. Bradley's concerns that all development increases volume of water downstream and he's got personal concerns of flooding downstream. So you were explaining how the basin, because it will infiltrate into the groundwater all around it, that it will in fact, de I, I, my understanding was, decrease the volume of water coming off that site. Now that it's not expected to infiltrate much at all, um, how does that affect the overall volume coming off the site versus, versus the picture painted before? How, okay. how has the picture changed? This is, this is really an engineering thing which is difficult to explain. Um, it's a timing thing. It's tied to uh, your discharge rate and your volume leaving the site. So basically what we assess for, to protect downstream resources and what have you is let's just say, let's just take one point discharge, for example. Um, the peak of the storm hits that, hits your drainage system, and if you have no detention or anything, it goes right out the pipe, and now you got an increase in the peak rate, and you got an increase in volume. When you add some detention, it holds some volume back, and this allows the peak rate to be less leaving the site. Does, does that make sense to everyone? So. In what we have when we have infiltration as well, that basin, though it has a poor rate, it will provide infiltration. And we also have infiltration in the uh, roof drains from half of the roof area. And the sand filter systems on the sides of the trench will also infiltrate. So there's a large amount of infiltration going on that we don't take credit for because we try to play this a conservative role. So the, the reduction in volume will be not only the eventual infiltration through the sides of the sand filters, through the infiltration trench, as well as in the detention basin itself, but there's also a storage volume within the sand and the piping that will infiltrate into the soil as well. So there's a substantial volume it's really hard to identify. It would be a science project to go through and try to quantify. And here again, you'd have to look at different storm events. Um, but basically, the volume reduction 
is based on the time of the storm event. So when you're looking at your stream and you have a flow regime in that stream, your peak rate decrease is the immediate initial decrease, the peak of the storm. Your volume is also decreased because you're holding back a bunch of water and holding it on site. And as the storm it passes and leaves, whether it's a 24 hour storm or whatever, then you're slowly releasing through all these under drain systems. So since it's after the storm, the volume capacity of all your local streams and stuff has increased because it's already past the peak of the storm. Okay. Does that make sense? Did I explain that properly? <laughs> you, you explained it in engineering terms, okay? You get into layman terms and when you mix the words together, they don't always add up to what you're saying. But, but I don't have a PE behind my name, so I, I can't. I uh, do I'm, think it's important to add to that. Our calculations that we submitted to the town engineer, we do them in a conservative way that does not take into account the infiltration that we will have out there. So even though we've added this under drain into the system, it does not change the calculations that we've provided um, to Allison, and it does not um, it does not change the fact that we will be reducing the peak rate and the peak volume. I think that's the well, important she, part. She verified your work after you submitted the underdrains, correct? Correct. She so has her been, memo. Her memo represents the underdrain. We have been okay. discussing the underdrains with her throughout the process. Okay. All right, Aaron, what else have you got? We'll save the alternate solutions till a moment from now. Oh. What other comments? Well, I think that it'd be appropriate to go into the significant impact aspect of things. Well, what do you, what do you have? Or don't you have other issues or questions? Well, I want the, um, the issue about the f Mr. Commissioner Hyman's uh, concern about the fill, the, the building demolition material. I, I want to get that all behind us, that's part of the significant impact. Well, um, I don't well, know which... You're, you're going to bounce significant activity. I'd like to say that to the end, if you can bring out what... Uh, I, I, I feel you might be alluding to something and I might be forgetting it, I don't know. We do have to... I, I don't know if you want to take time to re go over the conditions of approval tonight that I presented well, uh, at, on the desk. Everyone got a copy of that? Well... Uh, or. They're agreeing to the conditions of approval. If the, the trouble is that if, the, if there's a yes or no answer to it, that's fine. If we're going to have a long dissertation about it, I mean, I don't think that's necessary. I shouldn't say not necessary, but uh, not productive. Not productive. Non-productive. I mean, if you can highlight them that this is one of your conditions and they're agreeing, and that's it, and it's a change from what it was before. Not, we'll move on to uh, alternative uh, solutions or alternative options. Well, I, th I think maybe if you want me to hit the highlights of the conditions hit, of hit approval. The highlights. I know okay. you had some highlights. You worked a long time on this. Yeah, but but by the way, it's the crux of it is the same conditions of approval for the last two permits that this commission approved for this site. That's what I started with. We tweaked it very little. Um, because it was a good foundation, you know, these conditions of approval. Um, I think I want to talk about uh, number three is bonding. Um, I hoped we would have an estimated uh, bond figure for tonight, but we don't actually need it till the night of the decision. Um, we definitely need it if, we, if the commission decides to move forward with this application and approve the application. So a bond estimate came in today and my town engineer needs more time to look at it. It was in a different format than she was expecting. She's gonna review it, and then I will review it. She'll review it from her perspective, I'll review it from my perspective. So we'll have that ready next time. Um, of course, the, the, biggest, the biggest, the most important thing about this project is the independent uh, erosion control monitor. That, that is number one, and if the applicant agrees it's, it's very, very important too. That someone is out there every day looking at this, thinking about this. It's a, it's a big site moving around. 
you know, uh, looking at things uh, with imagination, what could happen, what might happen, and working with the, the applicant or the project site manager. And um, I guess they're also having an independent, you're having another third party or not sure about that, but, um, and of course that independent site monitor works closely with the town departments. The Public Works Department, Water Department, Water Division, um, Engineering, my office, and uh, the scope of that uh, person's work, or that firm, it's gonna be a firm, can't be a, a single person, it has to be a, a team. Uh, the scope of that firm's work is attached to the end of what I handed out tonight. It's the same scope that was used in the previous two permits. Um, this will have to be advertised by the town. The town will prepare the bid to be advertised for this uh, engineering or erosion control, certified erosion control uh, professional. Um, and then it goes out to bid. So it's a process and the applicant knows it's gonna take a little two, you know, two month time at least max to turn this around get someone on board. Um, and th th that's very, very critical to this. Okay, that was in number three, uh, condition number three. Uh, flocculent use. I, I can't remember if we went over this last time. Did we go over the jute netting and stuff, uh, Matt, last time at the last hearing? We did, okay. So the change in the flocculent use, there's gonna be a lot of flock in used on the site now in the, uh, Diversion swales. Uh, that was a change last at the last hearing. We heard about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Hitting the high points. Here. Box turtle protection. I just don't. That maybe hasn't been mentioned tonight at all. So that is that is part of this. Okay. Um, Reporting, as uh, Matt went into great detail, the, they call it the SWIP permit with, I believe, is that right, Matt, with the DEP. They, um, they have to get that uh, permit approved before they can start construction. And there's weekly reporting, and that will, one of these conditions of approval is that the town gets copy of that weekly reporting. So we will be, we'll be on, I'll have a pulse on this, on this project. And then the last two are two conditions which the applicant asked me to add as conditions of approval and because I wanted them as opposed to uh, the applicant wanting them per se. So these were two I wanted. Um, one was about dewatering areas. These sediment traps have to be dewatered and we don't know where the muck is going. Essentially you muck them out periodically and you know, I wanna know where the muck's going and the uh, last one is, oh, well, that's just a minor uh, uh, plan uh, problem. Okay, so that's- Commissioners, that's you've got any questions regarding Aaron's topics? Not? Okay, <laughs> then if you wanna continue on on prudent alternatives, feasible and prudent alternatives. Certainly. So, um, microphone, get, get in tight. Of course. So, while we do have um, activities on the site, we do have um, temporary and permanent um, activities, we, we do not have any direct impacts to the wetland uh, or upland review areas as a result of this application. So it is a little tricky for me to, um, to, since we're at zero in terms of some of these numbers here, we, we can't quite, um, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Senaviva. So the, the, the premise of the alternative discussion is to, to try to demonstrate to you folks that the activities in front of you um, are, are the best case scenario. So all I've been able to do is, um, where we are lucky, however, on this application, is that we've had numerous plans in front of this commission in the past 
along with the original submittal on this application uh, that did have greater uh, impacts than the application that is in front of you. So for the alternative discussion, I just wanted to summarize that um, for you folks, and I think it's, it's fairly appropriate. Uh, previously um, approved through this commission was 101 square feet dual warehouse application, and this table here um, shows the changes in impacts with respect to um, the application that we have in front of you. So previously approved had 400 square feet of uh, activities in wetlands. Uh, we now have zero. That is a 100% improvement. Um, <clears throat> activities within the upland review area, we were pushing 90,000 square feet on the previously approved application. Right now we're at plus or minus 18,000 square feet. And let's remember that this is all, all of it is within, is, is for road improvements and maintenance in between the two ponds. We have no upland review area impacts on undisturbed land. It is all within the roadway. That is still an 80% improvement. Uh, activities in the Muddy River setback area, this was associated with um, some of the work and with the utilities that were going to be installed um, in that area. We have revised this application has zero impacts in that area. That's a 100% increase. And then the increase in impervious area from the previous application was pushing 1.6 million square feet. We're at uh, plus or minus 11 acres. So this is a 70% improvement with this application. So I think that's uh, a, a demonstration of previous applications to now with this percent improvement. And then the other important part of this is the evolution of this application, this specific application uh, with this commission. Um, so one of the items, that activity that we discussed the, in between the ponds, originally to make the grades work, to make the turn to get up once you get past the ponds, we were raising the grade between the ponds. We have since eliminated that work. Uh, to raise that grade, we were going to need to install retaining walls. We have eliminated all that work. So again, any activity between the ponds, we're not widening the road, we're not changing the elevation of the road, strictly maintenance of the road. So that was a, a very important um, change to the design. You can imagine if we were constructing retaining walls in between the two ponds, that would be a lot. And then um, we had work within the 50-foot upland review area next to the small pond in discussions with the water department. They wanted us to move everything outside of that 100 foot that they have. The consequence was we've removed all work from your buffer as well. And then, uh, as I discussed, the, uh, that was, just to quantify it, that was 7,000 square feet of upland review area work that now is not happening. And then we were also installing utilities in the um, Muddy River corridor that we are not, that was almost 3,000 square feet of activity that was in this application originally based on work with the water department has been removed. So that that's, sums up the, the alternatives. The alternative versus what the previous application was or the improvements of the previous application. I don't know if that's the true term of alternatives. Alternatives is, is uh, a bigger retention pond or which doesn't fit on the site. I mean, I don't want to go there because it gets, it gets going. Anything else tonight at this time? I think we're good, Mr. Chairman. Did, okay. Are we, are we uh, Commissioner Hyman, are you good with your concern about the fill, the building demolition material at this point? They gave a very good explanation of what the material was. That was very important to me. It was, uh, they described the back wall that was primarily concrete. It's a carbonate. I don't have any concerns with crushing that up. Do whatever you want with it. And the other was masonry, but I was more concerned with interior building materials, which wouldn't be crushed up as they have described and showed 
and the fact that the majority of it is going to be capped to a great extent, it's going to be capped, and there will be no infiltration from the piping on the east side. That was really important to me too because of the stratigraphic sequences that exist in that area. Uh, that would have been a terrible place to uh, allow water to get into that and filter through it, no matter what it is when it's crushed up like that. The fact that it's under road surfaces and by and large under the building as shown, my concerns of that are significantly diminished. Uh, my biggest concern became the activity of what they're doing and um, that is a huge amount of material they're going to be taking out, displacing and moving, leveling it off essentially for the purpose of the building over that area. That activity, as they demonstrated as a extremely robust uh, system to protect it. I would just have one question with regard to it. How long do you anticipate that would take to do that kind of a movement? Uh, for the record, Jeff Checkway with Clear Properties. Um, in speaking of the, the, the cut and fill process, um, you know, it's, it would typically start on a project like this in the, in the spring after the thaw, and uh, we would, you know, work towards probably anywhere from 90 to 120 days for all the cut and fills, I believe, on site, um, which would hopefully kind of wrap you up in, in July. But you wouldn't be cutting the entire site at once and filling the entire site. You'd take portions of it from the higher peaks, cut into the hill, bring it to the lower sections, and over the course, and I think, with, I, f I forget if Matt had spoken about it, but with the course of the, the DEP regulations, you're required to stabilize open areas, I believe within 14 days if they're, if, if they're not to be, you know, continued to be handled. So you would be stabilizing the, those pieces of the upper section after they were cut and placed lower. And as the lower sections came up, you would start stabilizing those and yeah. you'd be placing that other, uh, crushed material also with imported dense grade material on top of that to stabilize as well? Yeah, you describe a phasing to the operation that you're going to do. Can that be written out, so to speak? You know, you, you, one third of it will be opened up and then you continue on. I don't know if that's possible or not. That, you could answer that, I can't. It, to, it's generally a, a means and methods thing with the contractor. Um, it's hard to dictate to them what you can do, like but similar. <laughs> I mean, but it's the intent that 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 process would be also the intelligent way to do it from a time and schedule and even a cost yeah. implication to do it in that manner. You you described almost the entire summer, three months, ninety days, three months, no significant storm during three months. That's scary. And again, that's why you have to have that robust thing, and that's why phasing it is absolutely critical. Uh, I would think experience would provide you some kind of a, uh, an outline that you could write, document that outline as to how you're phasing this in, just so that's part of the record and you're not going to do anything that you wouldn't want to do. I know you would do that. I would hope you would do that anyways, but I would love to see that as just part of your documentation, a, a sequence of activity, because activity is by far the most important thing in this particular event. That's all. Thank you. I, I can add one thing is that during that cut fill process, you're, the goal, and also to stabilize that 450,000 square foot pad, the uh, 10 acres or so, is you would be trying to get that to grade first so you would stabilize it. Also for the term of construction, you can start um, your foundations and footings and uh, you know pour your slab in that area which would stabilize that area you know, of, of the yeah. building pad. You have the vision, spell it out for us please. Well, okay. Oh, as, okay, for record keeping, how would that be? Are you gonna hand something in or how are we leaving that? What Commissioner Hyman requested? It's a general operational procedure in which they would just simply describe we will take out north section, south section. I would imagine you start with the area that needs the most to move it to the other section. 
how would you do that? Where would you begin? That's the kind of description that I think we look for. A phase, you describe the phase. You described it, put it into a statement. All right, but he wants to know, the question is, if you're gonna generate a staging plan, are we going to require it? And are we going to require it as one of the conditions of approval, then it can be fed into the system that way. That's the question that, that I believe she came up with. The applicant, uh, as the applicant, I, I'd like to ask that something like that, if we could provide, would be provided prior to the start of construction, or you know, once all the erosion control measures are inspected and we're approved to move the cut you, and fill. In other words, you have no problem generating a plan. Correct. I'd, I'd like it to be done by the contractor of record, which we don't have to date. Well, it definitely can be provided. Well, then that that uh, will, if there's a gets to be a, a, a vote on it, that will have to be worded in the vote or in the, the motion. Yeah, like I would assume you tell them what you want done. We want to know what you want to tell them you want done, essentially. Will it absolutely follow that path? Probably not, but we would like to know what your ideas are, what you would anticipate doing. Uh, I, I would hope it has serious, thoughtful anticipation. And just give us a description of that. So the erosion control plan does include a construction sequence. I think an appropriate uh, potential condition of approval would be that the construction sequence would be modified to provide some language with respect to the construction phasing uh, per Mr. Heilman's request. I think that, that is works. an appropriate place to do that. Yeah. Okay, Aaron, you have a note of that, so it'll be documented on what the request might be? Yes, I, I made it. I, okay. I, I made a Start. note of that. What's that? I, I made a note of that, but actually there's something that impressed me in your cut and fill stabilization materials you handed in that I think a lot of people don't know, that you were going to uh, install that reinforced turf mat and the erosion controls like as you go along. And if a storm was coming, you're going to tack something up, something like, could you talk a little bit about that? So uh, I think um, uh, it was referenced uh, a second ago. Uh, the general permit does require that uh, er this, any area be stabilized that's not being worked. Um, 14 days, I think, is what it has in it. So um, you can't just leave every part of the site open at all times. So, the goal is to get an area stabilized as quickly as possible, and any of the um, steeper slopes, we will be applying the erosion control blanket as quickly as possible uh, in compliance with the regulations. It is not appropriate to install that in any temporary manner. Um, most of those storms have wind and things like that associated with it, so we would not be installing that blanket in any temporary manner, but as the slopes are stabilized, they will be getting their final treatment. Um, it's not only is it the economically appropriate way to do it, it's the environmentally uh, way, appropriate way to do it. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions? Not at this time. None. Allie? No. Libby? No. Jeff? Mike? Nope. Okay. No. Okay. All right, you're done your presentation now for the moment? Okay, then this is a public hearing, and I open the, the comments to the public. Uh, name and address for the record, and they direct them as wetlands issues. Adelaide Kopfer, 35 Whistle Tree Road. Thank you for taking comments. Um, I would like to start with the, with the topic we were just talking about, the phasing of the construction. Um, town staff had asked that not the entire site be open at, one, at the same time, but all I can see are sectors, or I don't know if, if I understood that right, that maybe you start cutting first and then filling in on the other side. So I really don't see phases. Are, are you going by sector, open up one, and, and do that first, like 
uh, anything that would go in sediment tra temporary sediment trap number one, and then after that do number two, or I, I guess that's not how it works. So maybe you can explain the phase, the actual time. Well, well I, I, the, and, phasing, and the phasing isn't tied to the sediment control one, two, three, four. If it's phased in, there's still all the, the sediment control is a train. In other words, they're all tied together. They're all working as one system, correct? They're all working as one system. Well, the phasing is going to be as they cut and they fill, regardless of how they do it, they cut, they fill uh, in pieces. And work. that's the phasing concept. Right. And get it stable. And, and I think that plan that, that's going to be written, I would hope that it's not only a condition that there is a plan, but I would hope that the commission has the opportunity to look at that plan and review that plan, and then Erin or whoever well, else can review that. Well, the, the soil erosion control plan has, has phasing in it, but what you really have for protection, as Erin spoke before, you're going to have a site monitor representing the town. And as he sees the site, if it's not, if it's over, opened up too much, he should be the one to control the opening of the site and the phasing of the site or the phasing of the, the earth moving, fills, the cuts and the fills. Okay. Um, and then second point is I think Ms. O'Hare spoke to that already. <clears throat> Uh, I had a similar question. Um, the temporary sediment traps will discharge stormwater between the one and year, two year storm. Um, you already explained that construction sediment traps or temporary sediment traps are designed differently than the, the permanent ones. But um, to, to me it's concerning that it's only a one or two year storm being the criteria for, for these traps. Because as, as we've heard tonight and as we've all experienced the last day and the last years and the years before, those bigger storms might be coming rather quick. And um, it's, I just don't think it's safe. Even if with the drawdown, by the way, if I understand, if I remember, remember that correctly, um, that small pond drawdown, there was an issue with the previous applications and the maintenance hasn't been done for more than seven years, what it should have been. So I, it, it would be interesting to see is that technically even still working the, the mechanisms that they were talking about. Um, and another question that I didn't quite understand I'll, uh, one more point. Um, if we're talking about one year, two year, or hundred year storms, in one of my letters to the commissions, I, I quoted, I cited an article from Yukon that says that those, whatever size of storms, might happen four times as often in the not all too far future, meaning we have at least. I don't know. I don't want to go into number, but it's it's going to increase. We all know that by now. It's going to be more, more often, more heavy downpour within a shorter time. So it it is clearly an, a big issue. Um, then one other question with the infiltration time. Um, that would be for the permanent sediment basin. Do I understand that correct, that the underdrain can actually bring down the infiltration time from 25 days to 72 hours? Is that, is that correct? I believe the answer is yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. This, uh, it, it's not a, see, I don't believe it's a question and answer with the public to the commission. You have your, you voice your comments, and it's not that we're trying to find an answer for them. We're taking your comments in okay. consideration into our vote. Okay. Um, so, if the infiltration is brought down to 72 hours, 
does that in any way affect um, the, the, the neighbors around with wells or the neighbors downstreams that will be more affected a, directly with the muddy river, um, the, the amount of flow in the muddy river, water flow, and also with the wells, with, with the water that used to infiltrate all along the hill and now basically from that big sediment basin through the underdrain ends up draining into Muddy River and not infiltrating as much anymore. Um, then I have one more question in, in one of the replies to the water division. Um, I found the numbers for the parking spots required just by the square footage of the warehouse were 440. Originally provided were 356, I think. But then in the reply to the water division, all of a sudden there's 527. So that is very confusing, I think. Um, And also in that same response, I think they said there is no tenant yet. So it would be interesting if maybe that, that was a few weeks back. So maybe meanwhile, they, they know what the tenant is. And if, if they even, I, I, I just don't understand why are they trying to maximize the usable space and the warehouse and the, and the parking lot if there is no tenant yet? Do, does it have to be that big? Um, overall, I find this application is not complete. There are still some incongruencies, and I understand some of them, or most of them, are part of the conditions of approval. Um, but there are still between plans and reports and responses, it's, it's just not consistent, I find. And I think that is, that is not, that's not a status that should be approved. Um, the alternative discussion, with all due respect, if you compare it to the previous applications that covered the entire site, that, that's, comparing apples to pears, because now we're only talking about this development on the southern half. For that part of the property, it still doubles the impervious cover. There is, a, and I think the, the 60 or 80% improvement on not infringing on the wetlands, that is mostly a result of not touching the northern half, because there's much more wetland there. So, as, as uh, Chairman Vitali said, I think that is not a true alternative discussion. Um, alternatives would be making a smaller footprint, having less impervious cover, having more space for infiltration. The, the roof, now that there are no perforated pipes in the back, so basically the roof drainage more or less also goes in the big re uh, retention basin, in the, in the permanent basin. So not only the parking lots, but a lot, the, I, I would guess the majority of, of the roof also goes in there, one way or the other, because there's not enough room for, for that to actually infiltrate. Um, so overall, I, th I, I still feel there's quite a considerate risk for the Muddy River and for our drinking water and for the wells around and downstream. Um, so with all due respect, I would ask the commission to not approve this permit tonight. But if you do go along, uh, have, have them come up with, with a smaller footprint. But if you do go along, I would wish that you clarify the construction phases, as we talked about, and that that is um, that that the sequence plan is part of not only part of the con 
not only part of the conditions of approval, but that you can actually view it before it happens. Um, I would also like to ask that the discharge from the site is also um, monitored and measured for hydrocarbons, both from spills, possible spills from the parking lot. And I still think that um, all those trucks and the number of trucks does matter and does affect the water quality. So I would ask that that is part of the conditions as well. And then, yeah, the, the bond discussion would really be interesting because if in the worst case there is an, there is an um, incident and the Muddy River and possibly the Mackenzie Reservoir gets affected, then what? Who pays for that remediation? Can it even be done? How long would it take? And so I'm, I'm still concerned. I, I understand that they're going to great length, but I think it's still not there yet. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. <laughs> My name is Scott Gray. I live at 14 Oxford Trail in Wallingford. And um, I just want to thank you guys for giving us, the public, a chance to listen and, and weigh in. I appreciate that. And I also want to say that I was out of state for the other meetings. Had I been here, I would have been, um, been standing up and commenting and taking notes, et cetera. So I'm only able to comment on what I heard tonight. And I'll be brief. Um, the applicants stated in the alternative discussion component that they are looking for best case scenarios. That's, that sounded good. However, they also stated that the, um, in regards to catching and containing rainwater, uh, that their calculations of runoff during construction were designed under the contingency plan looking at one or two inch rainfall events in a 24 hour period. I believe that's was clearly said. Yesterday, as we talked, we had a, uh, a storm that approximated a 100 year storm. We received over seven inches of rain, so that's almost two and a half times what their contingency plan was designed for. Um, I also want to note, perhaps my figures are wrong because I see the learned gentleman shaking his head. Um, I also want to note that we had a 100-year storm 14 months ago also. So that's 200-year storms in 14 months. Um, you know, and additionally, we're currently experiencing rapidly changing environment due to climate change. And I think that what is laid out as the 100-year storm, 20-year storm, et cetera, really is not accurate. I mean, we just had two 100-year storms in 14 months with drought in between. So the data is definitely supports looking at the higher end of these storms, which was what I would consider the applicant would want to do under a best case scenario. Um, a couple of questions that I'd like to just throw out, and I know I'm not expecting answers at the moment, but my questions after listening to discussion tonight are a couple. How much of a rainfall event can that small pond contain? How much, I didn't hear the answer to that. I didn't hear that discussed. How much can that small rain, that small pond contain? Um, Commissioner Highland, I believe his name is, spoke about the cut and fill, and I thank you for your um, in-depth study of the material that was presented to you. Um, you talked about cut and fill, and, and the cut and fill also was described as, well, we'll be exposing bedrock. Um, I'm just a lay person, but I believe that bedrock will increase uh, rainfall erosional activity. There's, it, it just makes sense. It's going to run off that bedrock a lot faster than if it was uh, not tampered with ahead of time. And was that considered? Um, 
I live on Spring Lake. We had development that was in the past assured to the public to not affect the waterway. It dramatically affected the waterway. Docks that were sitting in three feet of water back then with a solid ground beneath them now sit in one foot of water with two feet of sediment thanks to the development up on Research Parkway at this very site. Um, as I said, I'm a lay person and my gut, my intuition says that uh, this planned activity seems like the same demon wearing a different costume. We've dealt with this before and a lot of the town people, especially in those neighborhoods concerned, myself included, say, this is just a big fat no. Uh, this project, a significant project, is situated right at the headwaters of the Muddy River, which supplies our town drinking water with lots of communities along that waterway in between. Um, that fact alone, right there, should deem this project unacceptable. There should not be a major development project happening in this location. And we've seen what happens when it happens. It's been very destructive. And for many reasons, the town has shot this down twice before. As I said, we're looking at the same demon wearing a different dress. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for your time and efforts and uh, dedication to reviewing this project. Um, my name is Juliette Buccilli. I live at 39 Cliffside Drive. Um, and I was born and raised in this area and raising my children here. And as you can see, I do work for Yale New Haven Hospital. Very proud to work there. And I serve women for um, fighting against breast cancer. And it really troubles me to think that, um, you know, we can feel comfortable moving forward with something that can affect um, something that we're directly ingesting. You know, our water, drinking water is very important. And it's very scary to um, witness what I witness on a daily basis and the ages of younger women being diagnosed with many different types of cancer, children with leukemia, more and more people around us. And I think we really need to take into consideration some of those health, those major health risks. I mean, not just do we want to make the water, yes, we want to make the water safe and we want to make sure we're making those right decisions, but one wrong choice could really affect somebody's life in a very, very negative way. So, again, thank you for your time. That's all I'll leave you with, but thank you again. Bradley, to Hampton Trail. Jim, I don't have an E in front of my name either. And I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn. Express. But what I do have is 49 years of on-site experience when it comes to the Muddy River, Bristol Myers, and the environment all the way up to the headwaters just north of Carpenter Lane. Uh, the commission, uh, you should have, it was part of the record of my letters from June 12th and uh, June uh, 25th. I'm not gonna go through those again, but again, uh, our concerns are the increased water volume due to the increased size of the impervious area, soil erosion of the muddy river that are very affluent floodplain soils, the same that occurred 
during construction of the Bristol Myers uh, site. I gave a article to Aaron last week. Uh, you should all have a copy of it. And it's entitled, When It Rains, Climate Models May Underestimate Future Floods. And just a brief uh, comment on that. Climate models may be significantly underestimating how extreme precipitation will become in response to a rise in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, a new Yale-led study uh, finds. We've heard in the news over the last several weeks, out in the Midwest, a 1,000-year storm. And we've seen the devastation that uh, occurred there. We also seen in the Midwest, the Mid-Southwest, 100-year storms. And those seem to be occurring, they can occur any, uh, any month. And at, has occurred many times, the Muddy River can become a raging river, and where it will go should never, never be under estimated and will overwhelm any engineered structures. Elevations according to the USGS topographic map at the head of the river that's on the upper end of Carpenter Lane, the elevation is 542 feet. At Spring Lake, it's 262 feet, a drop of 280 feet. A rainfall of just four to six inches turns the muddy river in that area into a raging river, let alone what an eight or 12 inch storm can cause. Also, the Muddy River flows through the WPA, the uh, Watershed Protect Protection Area, into Spring Lake and is classified as a AA uh, stream, river, by deep. But that was in 2013. I couldn't find anything since that. And also, that serves, as other people have stated, 94%, that's 94% of the town's uh, drinking water through Mackenzie Reservoir. In our area, and south of Spring Lake, there are approximately over 114 private wells in this area <clears throat> And I and others have seen chlor chloride levels rise in our wells. Mine in 1984 was 67. And now it's over 100. I wasn't aware of the construction uh, debris up there on the Bristol uh, Myers site until it was presented this evening. And chlorides, chlorides are in construction debris, especially cement. I've continued to write to the town, public works, town engineer, about the issues, written letter after letter, I get no response. I even invited the town engineer, when she took over that department, to come out and walk the area with me. Totally ignored. 
totally and fully ignored. As a side note, it's, it's kind of funny. I heard seven inches of rain. The news reported five inches of rain. The rain gauge at uh, Meriden Markham Airport measured 2.8 inches at 3.37 p.m. That was yesterday. The concern I have uh, with, with the amount of uh, rain, the culverts that are under Hampton Trail with this storm, they were about 75% of capacity. And I'm pretty sure that because of the dry summer we had, it didn't overflow the banks. I mean, if we had seven inches of rain, it would have been in my garage. In conclusion, water will become a valuable commodity in years to come, as market analysts have stated. Now is the time to go above and beyond to protect our water resources. In my opinion, this application should be denied due to the town not addressing uh, downstream flooding and also water quality. And the moratorium should be placed on this parcel of land as well as the land in the WPD, the, Walling, the Watershed uh, Protection uh, District, to further protect the town's drinking water su uh, supply. Thank you. All right, good evening. Thank you for everybody's time and hard work. My name is Sonia Wolf. I live at 14 Oxford Trail on Spring Lake. And um, there's been a lot presented here, and um, I've been to a lot of hearings and planning and zoning um, meetings, hearings uh, regarding this, this site. And, um, and I can really appreciate, you know, the fact that the um, applicants, you know, purchase this property and, um, and are looking for a way to develop it and, and you know, make money on it, basically, re regain um, what they spent and make money on it. Um, however, <laughs> I just, um, I think that the location, the headwaters of any river that feed drinking waters are just not the place for a development like this. It should absolutely be protected. Um, it's, and I just want to go on record as saying that. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm someone that um, also has developed a, an autoimmune issue um, with, you know, high levels of chloride and sodium and potassium, you know, in my system. And, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't had my well water checked for that, but I will. Um, it's just for all of the reasons that were stated for the, you know, increasing storms, for climate change, for um, the degradation generally of our environment, I think this is a spot that needs to be preserved. I don't know how it can happen, but in my heart of hearts, I know that that is the right thing to happen here, not all kinds of engineering things that over time are gonna fail. And I was wondering, when they do, and we're downstream, and this has all been passed, then what? Then it was like, oh, you know. Um, yeah, the horse has left the barn at that point. Thank you all.
evening. Good evening. My name is Bob DeMeo, um, Marie Lane in Wallingford. Um, I have a question and a comment. My comment is similar to others. I think that, you know, this property, it's unfortunate that we've had a buyer who very fairly bought this property and wants a development. Um, I think there's opportunities to develop. It doesn't have to be this intense of a use. I think the comparisons to the prior application in 2018, frankly, is a little disingenuous because that was, you know, just over the top. Understanding that this commission approved it, I can understand why you would bring that fact forward. I disagree that they ever should have approved that. So um, that's one. The, the, my, my actual question now is a process question. Um, obviously, buildings are a big part of the, the plan that you consider and you look at the site and the coverage and whatnot. They're proposing one building right now. If you were to approve this, what is the process for a year from now or two years from now? They come back, want to put another building up, or they want to subdivide the property. Does, do it, residents have any protections from that? What is the water, the wetlands processes for kind of administering that? You know, can you restrict, if you were to end up approving this, can you restrict and say, whatever it is you approve, if you were to do it, which I don't think you should, that this is it. No more building expansion on this site. You can't build on the north side of the property. Um, so that's a question, actually. I would hope that, I know you said you don't always answer the questions, but if you can answer that one, I would appreciate it. Good question. No, I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> other, other than, uh, there, there's so many, pieces to that question, I'm not going to get into it. But basically, it comes in as another application, and we go through the same process again. Okay, okay. but could, could there be consideration of limiting development? Mr. Chairman, if I might interject on that, um, I think something that's very important for everyone to understand is we work with regulations. There are a lot of things that, having been on this commission for in the past and, and currently, there are things that you don't like. There are things you do like. And it is never the time to get into arguments of what you like and don't like about your, what you work by. We have regulations we're required to work by. If we don't like the amount of things that people do on a piece of property, then we have to somehow find language to build that into our language, in, into our regulations. This is too for planning and zoning. They are the ones that allowed this section of our town to be established for this kind of activity. We cannot, as a commission, sitting here in wetlands say, you can't do what planning and zoning says you cool in this property. We have no jurisdiction on what they're allowed to do based on planning and zoning. What we have to focus ourselves on is what they do and how it might affect, potentially could affect our wetlands. And so I would like to see personally a bigger setback I take note of the fact that they designed their plans up to our 50-foot regulated area. I would like to see that bigger. I don't ask them to do that now. That's completely inappropriate. That's something that we, as a commission, have to do with our regulations outside of a public hearing. So as much as I would love to be able to sit here and say, you can't do this, I don't like it. No, I have to live by the regulations that I'm part of its creation. And there are things that, yes, I would like to see change. And I think this is a good opportunity to highlight them, not apply them, though, at this particular time. Lori Mundegrall. I live at 16 Martin Trail on Spring Lake. And my Excuse me? Get a little Sorry. closer to the mic. Lori Mandigrel, I live on 16 Martin Trail on Spring Lake. And my concern is that you are basing most of your information on the lease scenario 
when you're building something like a building or tributaries or whatever, shouldn't it be based on the worst scenario? I mean, you don't build your house and go, let's make it out of straw because it's really not that windy. You build it to withstand hurricanes and tornadoes, but yet you're not going to build this building to withstand 100-year floods. I, you know, I live downstream. It's all going to come down my way. I think you should be planning for the worst scenarios, not for the everyday normal scenario. Are there any other comments? Yeah, no, I already spoke and I don't want to take anybody else's time. Is it okay if I bring up two more small things? Two, promise. Okay, just, just want to remind everybody the total um, time frame for construction, if I remember that correct, is 12 to 18 months un until the final grading is done. And uh, even if it's only one summer, that's hurricane season. And then the other question um, that I forgot to ask previously, um, I think it was in a response to the water division where the applicant said the temporary sediment um, diversion swales, the, that kind of section of the different sectors, they have to be flexible, they will be um, adjusted as the grading changes. So my question is, the temporary sediment traps those four or five basins, I think number five has been taken out by now, so let's say four. Again, that's, that's one of the inconsistencies that I still, it's, it's not ready, but anyway, those four basins if you build a 44-foot wall and fill in that, that um, northwest corner with what you cut on the other end, are those temporary sediment traps also flexible and moving with the grading, or how, how is that going to work? Uh, um, <laughs> they, they shake their head yes, so I, I just wanted to bring that as a, as a concern. Maybe the commission can consider that when you make your decision to find the m most prudent solution for our drinking water. Thank you. Hi, um, Kathy Hunter, North Orchard Street, Wallingford, Connecticut. Um, I do have a PE after my name, but it is in electrical, so I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, one thing I will note is that a warehouse development on this site in terms of overall environmental impact would tend to be a lower impact than having a factory or other facility in that area. Um, so I think that should be taken into consideration that it actually is probably a development that is more appropriate for that site than an industrial site. Like we have other sites that frankly need to be cleaned up in this town that are outside of the area of this and I understand that this I what I'm hearing from my town's people is a deep level of concern rightfully so for the changing environment that we're dealing with right now in terms of the hundred year storm and I do think that the permit applicants have done their best to mitigate for that but the baseline codes and requirements which are outside the criteria of the permit may be what actually needs to be looked at. If the 100-year storm or the frequency of a 100-year storm is inadequate, when will those be updated? That's something that may be worthwhile taking up with the state or the appropriate agencies on that matter. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. All right. Um, there's a lot of information here to digest, and uh, we, we, uh, if there's no other comments from the group, I've got a couple comments. 
One, it's been talked about future development on this site. And we know there's a lot of additional land that can be developed. And I'd like to instruct Aaron to put together a report that says what would, what would be the procedure for the next, if, so, if they came in with another building on this site? Would it automatically trip a wetland permit? Would it need to be uh, 20,000 square feet of impervious surface? I mean, all the, the conditions, making sure they come back to wetlands if any future development comes on this site. Yes. <laughs> yes, it would trip another just by virtue. It, all they have to do is increase by 10,000 square feet of Im impervious surface, and it trips a w another wetland permit. Well, they've got probably, uh, I don't know, maybe two or 300,000 square feet of uh, impervious pavement up there that, that's still staying. If they swap that for a building, oh, it'd be interesting. Right, but... A, the building would require parking around it. So I, but I see where you're going, yes. And yes, they could subdivide. It's been expressed to me, yes, they could subdivide. Well, if you could, if you could generate a small report, paragraph or something, that uh, see what they, they can do or, or what they're able to do. I'd be happy to do that, but the, end, the close of the public hearing is the close of the new information, so. But that, that is a new information. I mean, that's information for the commissioners to make a decision. That's why I'm asking you to do it now as part of the decision-making process. Oh, uh, okay. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm reviewing what I was told today about the, clo the introduction of new information. And the, because the, uh, the uh, bond estimate is not per se considered new information, or, or I'd be happy to do it if I'm allowed to do it. That's fine. Meaning, I'll, I'll do, meaning to hand it in your, when would you like it handed in to the commission? You're saying uh, the at next the next meet meeting? Next meeting. I will be happy to do it if, if I'm allowed to do it under the regulations. It doesn't have to be in great detail. It's just the... I don't think there's the any legal precedent for that, actually. Um, which legal precedent for which? Well, whoever it is owns property, and they, they want to do something over here on their property. And so they drop a plan, and they go to a wetland commission and say, we want to do this on our property. We have no right to say, well, do you own a lot of land? I want to know what you're going to do. You well, I may that. disagree with you, Jim, on that. Because you're making, they're making acquisitions, especially on this graph. Well, yeah, that was inappropriate for them to compare what they Well, they compared to their last application, That's true. which is half the size. If they come back in with the other half of the application, true. then that fills the, the square footage. I just don't think you can hold them to anything specific on something they're not applying for. Well, you just, I'd like to know what, what they're not going to tell me what their plans are for the next half of the application or the mm. property. So I'd like to know what the, what the, um, their legal right is. And our procedure. I mean, it's, it's one thing if, if, we're, if I'm told that they would have to come back for a wetland permit because anything they build on that side of the property, on the north side of the property, was going to trick, trip the regulations that we have. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's true of any application. Will. Anyone who wants to do anything, if it involves a wetland or could potentially involve a wetland, they're required to have a wetland permit. It, it, right. Uh, if I may jump on, yes, it would, because it'd be the increase of stormwater to a wetland. So that the introduction of new water, or newly channeled water to a wetland, it, it, it would trip a wetland permit. And yes, they are allowed to subdivide. In theory, they have enough land they could subdivide. Well, or they could build, I've asked about this, a second building on the site. Both can happen. And they definitely would need a wetland permit. That I can't imagine any kind of development that wouldn't need well, a wetland just, permit. If they want to do something small enough to not allow a permit, please, you do it. I don't think that'll happen. I, I, 
I mean, they didn't come in with anything small here. I wouldn't expect them to come in with anything small on any property they have left. Um, they'll need a permit. I get, well, either way, either way. If you can put something together that gives a quick summary that, that uh, uh, any future development would more than likely trigger a wetland permit requirement. I'd be happy to do it if, I'd be happy to do it, and I hope I can okay. submit it to the if commission. I, I, now, how are we hand, I, yes, sir. I, I just, and I don't interrupt you. I, I do know that there's the prospect of closing the public hearing tonight, and there is a long history of what information your staff can provide after a public hearing is closed. That's why most typically, whether this commission or any commission that I've appeared before in the last 40 years or so, when they close their public hearings, generally they vote the same night. I understand the reasons why you're not tonight. I've heard it from Aaron and I've heard your comments uh, opening tonight. So I get all of that. But one of the things that I've cautioned her and I've had conversations with the town attorney is we all have to be careful. I can't communicate to any of you. Um, she can't communicate to any of you other than compiling information that you already have in your record. Now your regulations are already in your record. So I suspect that she could put together a simple narrative as to what procedures are for any application, whether it's this site or any other site. I would like the opportunity, however, that if she provides something, it'd be, it'd be only fair if it's run by the applicant so I can take a look. I don't always agree with, with uh, her analysis, just so, again, if the public hearing is closed, we'd like to be able to at least respond uh, if I think it's replete with errors. If it's that specifically, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Now, the other thing is the the um, staging. The staging, we all think that it's a good idea to, to have a written staging plan. And you feel that it, it's included in your soil and erosion control plan. With modification, without modification. The soil and erosion control plan has a construction sequence as part of the plan. My uh, comment earlier was an appropriate spot to add the phasing, add some dialogue about the phasing would be to that existing construction sequence. I don't know procedurally or um, administratively how that would happen with respect to closing of a hearing. I was only commenting that we already have well, the bones of it. And we we'll, could. we'll ask Mr. Senevi. <laughs> Let yeah. me offer to you, yeah, the, Aaron and I did the, uh, the calendar count. So we were, we were consistent right. in our, in our uh, review. You have until uh, September 23rd to close the public hearing. So my suggestion actually even before that when Commissioner Heilman was talking about a phasing plan and having that information provided to you. Uh, and um, I thought, how are we going to get it to you if the public hearing is closed? You can uh, vote to close the public hearing at some date between today and say a week from today or whatever length of time Aaron thinks she needs to provide this information so that it doesn't run any legal issues. In other words, that would be my suggestion, would be to give you, you know, you can have a vote to close the public hearing effective September 14th. Well, the, the one, one of the things I want to be careful of is not to close the public hearing on uh, September 21st and then October 7th we got a meeting. That time frame gets to be too thin. Uh, if there's, I don't know if there's anything that she needs to review or, or comment on, on uh, stuff that's been, been included. So, um, is, is uh, first of all, is the commission acceptable to closing the public hearing and voting next month on the meeting? Jim? Mm. Because we can, it just, just depends on what day to close the meeting on. Today's the 7th. <coughs> Based on everything that I've heard tonight, I don't see anything significant that well, would then, change. Then it should probably, she, is one week enough to get a few items straightened out, Aaron? Oh, 
I, I'd like Attorney Senaviva to expound on this I, idea. I've never heard about such. such well, a it, thing. It, they have the right till the twenty third. You said. You have the right we to don't, close the they, We don't have to be sitting here to close the public hearing. Well, period. that's what I mean. I've never heard of it being a public hearing happening without a commission sitting there. So maybe maybe Attorney Senaviva can tell me about this. This is interesting. I'm all ears. It, it's, it's designed to permit additional documents that have been requested this evening to be submitted. They can't be submitted with new information after tonight's meeting if they close the public hearing effective tonight. Right. I'm just making certain that that information which the commission appears to desire can be presented to them legally. And it can be presented to them legally if the public hearing is open. Uh, and you can close it effective as of the uh, pick a date, September 14th, a week from today. And in that understanding that the function of leaving it open for the week is for Aaron to provide you that report and for the applicant to provide greater, greater clarity on the phasing of the cuts and fills that was Is discussed. one week enough for your applicant? Yes. yes. Then, I, then I say we close it in one week from today. Um, be, before you act on that, let me just say, Attorney Senaviva, couldn't the commission direct me to do, to provide some information, and I provide it um, on October 5th, and that be considered. I can't do that. Not, not new information. It's a terrific basis for appeal. We don't want that. We, we, want, to, we want this to go forward on its merits. What we're asking for, though, is not new information. It's simply clarity on our existing regulations. So what we're asking for isn't new ne necessarily new information, but an, an interpretation of our existing regulations. But I think they want to respond to the new information. So that's what's making oh, it. Oh, I see. Yeah, Which that's the difference, maybe. Yeah. Right. I, m I missed something there. What? Right. Meaning tonight, the applicant's ability to have any influence ends when you end the, the public hearing. They can't opine, they can't do anything. So that's, I believe, the difference, right? Attorney Senaviva, that's why he would want to keep it open to allow him to look at whatever I put together about this uh, subdivision idea or... One of the, I agree, one, I mean, one of the fair provisions of the public hearing is that everyone has an opportunity to be heard. We have an opportunity to challenge if somebody says something that we believe to be inaccurate. And if something's provided after the public hearing is closed, we have to sit by mute when we think it's mm -hmm. wrong. It makes it difficult if that's the basis for your decision. That's all. And, and I don't think it's inappropriate. You've got to use the microphone. I'm sorry. I don't think it's inappropriate to take, you know, to allow another week for the filing. You may get letters from the public in that week. I mean, again, if the public hearing is open, mm -hmm. the public hearing is open. It's going to be closed at a particular date. That date is before the statutory end date of September 23rd. It was just an idea that I thought was, it is creative, but I thought it's still certainly legal because you have the right to keep the public hearing open until the 23rd. I also wanted to comment. And, and the public has a right, to, well, to submit letters, like you said, so. Good I, idea. I, I'm in favor yeah. of that. So uh, I'll, take a, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing one week from I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make just one quick comment on, uh, on some of the uh, uh, presenters or some of the speakers this evening. And that is, I just wanted to point out, uh, because I know there's such a, a, a large amount of information that's been provided to you, and I know, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time going through all of it, and it's, it is difficult to read and understand, but I did want to point out that the applicant does share the concerns about the quality of the drinking water. It, it does, whether they believe it or not. And importantly, there are two memorandum, one dated August 29th and one dated August 31st, from the senior engineer of the Water and Sewer Division. And the recommendation in those memorandums is, is, is our conditions of approval. It doesn't indicate that this is a plan that's going to negatively impact on the quality of water. And if there's one person or one department that spends its career, you know, making certain that the water uh, is, is uh, of good quality would be that division. So I took 
We took that as a very important memorandum when it came in. We were very pleased to see it. The other point, of course, too, is that the town engineer has also offered her opinion. And she, too, while looking at all engineering issues for the town, is certainly concerned about the quality of, of uh, the drinking water. Lastly, in, just in terms of prudent and feasible alternatives, your regulations are very clear. Um, is there an alternative that would cause less or no environmental impact? And what we're talking about is a prudent and feasible alternative. And, and I'm sure you guys and girls know it better than I do, but feasible is one of those words that allows this commission to consider the financial aspects of decisions. So it's prudent and feasible. And I can tell you, and you don't have to believe it certainly, but the applicant came to this presentation, to this proposal, based upon what it believed to be the least impactful, the largest it could build, no doubt about it, but the least impactful. That's why it didn't come in where it came in before with a million one square feet, it didn't come in with 800,000 square feet or 700,000 square feet. It came in with a number that BL advised them this we could design this so there would be no impact on the quality, the functionality of the wetlands. And that's what Matt Davison has, has offered his opinion to. So it, it's not just are there feasible and prudent alternatives, they have to be those that cause less or no environmental impact. Our position is, and Matt's confirmed that, over no opposition, that uh, there is no um, environmental impact to the wetlands or water courses. That, again, during the course of construction, there are concerns, and we've tried to address them with what's been identified as a robust plan, the independent site monitor recognizing that DEEP will be out there at the same time. So there's a number of bells and whistles designed to make your decision hopefully more comfortable. Thank you. Well, I will comment that, that the project completed a year from now or when it's completed, there's probably reduces any potential for negative impact. But there's no question during this construction phase, there's a great potential for impact, for negative impact. So you're weighing one against the other, construction versus permanent structure on it. This isn't uh, an easy application to deal with on this. Okay, if the commissioners have nothing else tonight for this application, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing on Wednesday, September 14th at 5 p.m. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the public hearing be closed on September 14th at 5 p.m. Is there a second? Yeah, the, the, of application A22-5.15 Research Parkway, the public hearing be closed at 5 p.m. on September 14th. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Allie? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just want to take the time to enter into the record for tonight's hearing everything that came in between July, 20, the t July 27th hearing and tonight, and that includes the letters from the public. There was a letter from Jack Aragoni. He wasn't here tonight, but you all got a copy of his letter in your packet. It was basically a concern about road salt was the number one concern in that letter. Also the letter that Ed Bradley mentioned and uh, Adel Adelaide Hoffer mentioned, she had two letters that ca came in. And also the letter that she came in with after the packet went out Friday night, there was a letter she walked in with. So, and that was handed out to you tonight. And uh, also what was entered into the record is the, um, well, all the comments from all the departments and my comments and my environmental planners report but all, and all the new material from the applicant that came in in the last week, certainly. But also, um, the, uh, I was instructed to say that the, um, the uh, proposed bond estimate that the applicant handed in today at around noon, that that would be part of the record. It's not finalized, but, it, but they did get it in as part of the record. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, we have some uh, uh, new business. Oh, up here. Yes, 
is uh, new business for tonight, Aaron? I am the walrus's effort tonight. I don't think they're here. Well, you have to ask, are they here? But um, that went out in your packet. It was um, a I thick document about a status report on the River Carter. Right. Frankly, I haven't had time to read it. It is uh, about four months late. Yeah, but what, what's the, it, it's just the report submitted under new business? Yes, we're going to, I'd like it on the agenda next time to review it. I've, I'm not pleased with that site, so I would like to take some time to read the report and go out there and make a report to you about what we, we should do about that corridor project. Go ahead. Next time. All right, the other, the other two... Landline telephone underneath here. That's what I took. Yeah, kicked. Yeah, well, that's it. It fell off, but there's a little shelf back there. Oh, no. oh the I got books under here, too. And, and, yeah. We're still on TV. Okay, Aaron, let's go on this uh, receipt of new applications. That's just standard well, stuff. Really, I'll tell you that later. Um, correct. Okay. Uh, to uh, those two applications, yes. Eight. Just receive them. Yes, they're received. All right. Um, the rest is, is pretty much uh, repetitious. Violations? Anything oh. new with violations? Oh. Um, yes. Uh, there are the t two, well, one pending, one brand new violation. Um, did, I believe you got a copy of the notice of violation uh, on the bottom, number four. Did everyone get a copy of that, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yes. This was, um, this is across from Oakdale, uh, this property. The commission actually approved it was, a, it was a, a development called Adams Landing, oh gosh, maybe 10 years ago. And that address is 76-90 South Turnpike. It's directly across from Oakdale entrance, okay, on South Turnpike. They, after this commission approved it, they came back maybe two years ago and, and subdivided off the northern section. Mm -hmm. So it's a vacant section. They subdivided it off. And it's just been idle. Well, one reason it's been idle so long is it's 75% floodplain, so you got problems with developing it. So anyway, so all of a sudden I'm driving by and it's covered with mulch. And at first I thought it was regular mulch. Well, it turns out it's pallet mulch. It's not tree bark mulch. It's ground up pallets. I actually got a call. Somebody ratted on <laughs> They said, go look at it closely, and sure enough, I. I, there was a picture that came out with the um, that I passed around a previous uh, packet. With you could tell it's it's got all sorts of plastic and screws in there and just it's pallets. It's not there's no tree bark. I could see no tree bark. Anyway, it's a violation on money counts. For this commission, you can't deposit anything in a wetland or within 50 feet of a wetland without a wetland permit. So this is wall to wall. Pallet mulch, wall to wall, <laughs> except for maybe 10 feet along the river. So, um, and the river runs primarily on the next property, but a little bit on this property. Um, anyway, so I issued the notice of violation to the property owner, which is some an outfit down in Bridgeport, and I and to Southern Pallet Company, which is they have an operation over at 340, 346 Quinnipiac Street. There, they have a also are under a notice of violation for their huge pile of pallets, uh, uh, in that case, crushed up pallets. That is an enormous pile, and um, that's its own violation. Anyway, so I issued the letter to both. I haven't heard from the property owner who's supposed to be here, he's supposed to call me, no one's called. He was supposed to appear tonight, he is not here. Um, and as far as Southern Pallet, Southern Connecticut Pallet, they called me immediately when they got the letter, and they said, that's not us. They go, come on, it's mulch pallets. They go, no, 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 it's mulch pallets. But we paid a guy to take it out of here. We paid a lot of money, because we're trying to get that giant pile of mulch down to satisfy you and other departments. So we paid him to take it out of here. So the individual he paid was Little K. Well, Carl, uh, Little K is um, 
is the landscaper that he paid to get this mulch out of there. So anyway, so there were about 60 mulch piles sitting on three feet of mulch, 60 mulch piles. Now, since in the last few weeks, it's been taken away. Taken away, pushed around, compressed, but most of this, a lot of the stuff taken off site, it's still a violation. Well, now it's about three feet of, it's just wall to wall, three feet of mulch. So what are you doing now? What's the next step now? Um, I'll talk to the law department about the next step. Okay. But there was some movement. I mean, they did take maybe half the mulch off the site, I would say. Okay. Anything else to come before us tonight? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion made. Second. Second. Motion made. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed?